Hello there, and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the podcast where every season we select a theme and then carefully pick six movies that fall under that theme. And then for each movie, your charming host, Mr. Bo Ransdell, and me, Chad Cooper, we work with a crackerjack team of researchers, consultants, and professional interns to pull together a delightfully entertaining and informative introduction on how and why each of these movies were made. Then after that introduction, we know you're wanting more. You're chanting and stomping your feet. You pull out your lighters and stick them up in the air. And that's when Bo and I return to hop on the microphones and give you a full review of the movie start to finish to see if it's any good. Now this is season 15 with a musical theme of Flop is Born featuring six movies with singers who really want to be actors. So they show up in a movie and guess what? These movies aren't any good. This episode, we are featuring Spice World, a motion picture starring the Spice Girls. You know, Sporty and Ginger and Prancer and there's Bambi and Dave and you and the other one over there. Look, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on the Spice Girls. Honestly, it'd be a little more suspicious if I was an expert on a British all-girl band from the 1990s. And speaking of suspicious people who know a whole lot about British all-girl bands from the 1990s, we found ourselves at the part of the show opening where I invite my co-host, Mr. Bo Ransdell, in here to fill our ear holes with cinematic stories of sensational stuff we didn't know we needed to know until we later knew we wanted to know it. So Bo, come on in here and tell us what we want. What we really, really want. To know about the Spice Girls and their curious cinematic debut film, Spice World. One of the seminal moments in music history has to be the Beatles' arrival in America. February 7th, 1964. It is the stuff of rock and roll legend. The Beatles, who had become a phenomenon in England, arrived in America to a throng of screaming fans. Two days later, They would perform for the first time in America on The Ed Sullivan Show, and the rest, as we so often say on this show, is history. But if you do, in fact, listen to Pick 6 Movies on the regular, you'll know that we know that you expect a twist on the story. But if you do, in fact, listen to Pick 6 Movies on the regular, you'll know that we know that you expect a twist to the story, and here it comes. The big appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show not the first time the Beatles appeared on television in America. It's just the first footage we have left. While everything I said in the opening is true, it's also only part of the story. The internet didn't exist in the mid-1960s, but we still had phones and televisions, so the Beatles weren't some secret being kept from the United States. Beatlemania was running wild. Their first album, Please Please Me, debuted in 1963, and on October 13th, just a few days after John Lennon's 23rd birthday, the Beatles performed on a show called Sunday Night at the Palladium, the biggest entertainment show in Britain at the time. They played a four-song set, and that performance led to the coining of the term Beatlemania around the reaction of Beatles fans to the music and the young men behind it. By November, they were performing for the Queen at a Royal Command performance. During that performance, a cheeky John Lennon told the crowd in the cheaper seats to clap their hands and quote, The rest of you, if you just rattle your jewelry. Yeah, he was a jerk, but it's that sort of thing that makes me a John guy. Anyway, all this ruckus across the pond was stirring up some frenzy in the good old US of A. Time magazine ran an article called the new madness, about the wave of Beatlemania sweeping the country. The big networks were sending news crews to England to get a peek for themselves at this growing phenomenon. They were poised to deliver the Beatles to American audiences on American airwaves, shot by American camera people, only the story got buried. What, you might ask, could bury the story of the Beatles? Well, the footage was shot and the stories assembled, But as it happened at the same time, President John F. Kennedy was touring Dallas, Texas and fell victim to political assassination. You might have seen that movie. So the Beatles story just disappeared while America's news covered the death, 
funeral and aftermath of John F. Kennedy's death, at least until December 10th or so, when the CBS Evening News aired their footage of the Beatles, but that report largely dismissed the Beatles as another fad, like hula hoops or genital piercings, missing entirely the fact that the country was wounded and hurting. And you know what's good? The Beatles. Their youth, their irreverence, their music? It was a balm for a nation that reeled in shock from the death of a young and vibrant president. No matter how far the media looked down its collective nose at the Beatles, the kids were tuned in and excitement was brewing before the calendar ever turned to 1964. Now, before the new year, demand for new music from the Beatles pushed the release of I Wanna Hold Your Hand to December 26th from its planned January release date. And when it hit US radio, it exploded in popularity. Paul McCartney told then-manager Brian Epstein, we're not going to America until we have a number one record. And that's just what they did. But before they made it to Ed Sullivan, the Beatles appeared on American television live for the first time on NBC's Huntley Brinkley Report, which was the most popular nightly news show at the time. That same show would later evolve into the NBC Nightly News, but at the time it was Huntley Brinkley, and that happened way back in November of 1963, right before the assassination of John Kennedy that would both forestall Beatlemania in the United States and set the stage for its impact. In July of 1964, A Hard Day's Night was released on vinyl, and it was a massive success, notable for being the first record in which the Beatles were the writers on every song, it would lend itself to a film of the same name. Now, as this season illustrates, when something is as popular as a recording artist, there are people who will try to parlay that fame into other interests, like movies, with typically awful results. But the Beatles are the exception that proves that rule. When it released on August 11th, 1964, about a month after the album dropped, it too was an enormous financial success, and that part was a foregone conclusion. The hysteria around the Beatles was such that the film could have been the Fab Four staring blankly back at the audience for 90 minutes, and would have likely set box office records. United Artists, the company behind the movie, didn't much care about the quality of the film one way or another. The real money, as they saw it, was on the soundtrack. Capitol Records had the rights to release music from the Beatles in the United States, with the exception of the soundtrack to the movie A Hard Day's Night, which would be all United Artists. If they could get the movie, and more importantly the soundtrack to the movie, out ahead of the release of the album from Capitol Records. Cha-ching! Unfortunately, both The Beatles and director Richard Lester, who would go on to do Superman 2 and 3, kind of interestingly, well, they wanted to make a good movie. The production of the film was cheap, about $10 million by today's standards, and it was shot fast and in sequence. It was a day in the life to mix Beatles songs, where we see the fellas bumbling through England on their way to a performance. Along the way, Paul's troublemaking grandfather disappears, gets Ringo tossed in jail, nearly upends the musical performance, and generally provides chaos while the Beatles themselves kind of snark their way through train rides and encounters with fans. It's got a wild, anarchic energy, and the Beatles, both individually and collectively, are really charming and funny and frequently self-deprecating. It is now hailed as one of the great rock and roll movies, and rightly so. It is the gold standard of get-them-to-the-show jukebox musical movies, and it provided a glimpse into the early years of a musical act that would go on to change music forever. Also, worth repeating, it's genuinely funny. So, I told you that story to tell you this one. In February of 1994, Bob and Chris Herbert placed an ad in a magazine called The Stage. It read thusly, Wanted, are you 18 to 23 with the ability to sing dance? Are you streetwise, outgoing, ambitious, and dedicated? Heart Management Limited, 
are a widely successful music industry management consortium currently forming a choreographed, singing, dancing, all-female pop act for a recording deal. Open audition. Please bring sheet music or backing cassette. Of the 400 or so would-be stars who auditioned, only 12 were brought back for a second audition. After further testing, both alone and as a group, five women were selected. Victoria Adams, now Beckham, Melanie Brown, Melanie Chisholm, Michelle Stevenson, and Jerry Hollowell, who joined in the second round. These women would make up the band Touch. They were put in a big house, given material, and the ladies began polishing their act. Along the way, Michelle Stevenson washed out and was replaced by Emma Bunton. All of the music was later discarded, but one of the songs the young women recorded was called Sugar and Spice. That would serve as the springboard to change their name to Spice, championed by relatively new addition Jerry Hollowell. If the guys at Heart Management were insidious, they were kind of dumb about it. While they were helping this new band Spice polish their act and record material, they didn't bother to put any of them under contract. When the ladies started butting head with their management team about the direction of this new band Spice, they convinced their management to put on a showcase to stir up interest in the band. The showcase was a success, and suddenly other management companies were coming a knocking, some of these with actual contracts. Some stories suggest that the members of Spice went on to swipe original recordings from Harp Management before they officially parted ways. The singing and dancing sensation, for sure though, signed up with Simon Fuller and 19 Entertainment, who then rebranded them Spice Girls after discovering a rapper already using the moniker Spice. So we had a name and we had an all-girl pop group ready to make it big. What they needed was a song. No, not that one. Yeah, that's it. In June of 1996, a video appeared on the UK music channel The Box from a new act called Spice Girls. The song was Wannabe, and it was an instant hit with viewers. At its peak, the video would air 70 times in a single day. The single released on July 7, 1996 and became a number one hit in 37 countries. It was the biggest debut from an all-female act and also the biggest selling single by an all-female group of all time. They released their follow-up in October, a catchy tune called Say You'll Be There, which would also go to number one. In December came the third single, To Become One, which also went to number one and became the fastest selling single of 1996. In November of that year, their album was released, named as their band had once been. Spice. It was met with phenomenal success, and the Spice Girls, Mel B or Scary Spice, Mel C or Sporty Spice, Emma Button, Baby Spice, Jerry Hollowell, Ginger Spice, and Victoria Adams, Posh Spice, were dubbed the Fab Five by many outlets. The enthusiasm around Spice Girls was that white hot, but like the Beatles, they hadn't made their journey to America yet. Over here in the States, Wannabe debuted at number 11 on the Hot 100 in America, which broke the previous record for a non-American act. That record was held by The Beatles for I Wanna Hold Your Hand. The album, Spice, didn't release in the US until February of 1997, and when it did, it sailed to the top of every chart. It would become the biggest selling album of that year and the best selling album by an all-female act of all time. In May of that year, it was announced Spice Girls would appear in their own film, spreading their message of pop music-fueled girl power to the masses. And say what you will about the group or the music, it was refreshing to see women unabashedly celebrating their own agency. And in the very next month, in June of 1997, Spice World began filming. The group was originally approached by the Walt Disney Company to do a film, but when the ladies read the, quote, Disney-fied script, which involved a single mom working hard to form the band, they shifted instead to a script written by Kim Fuller, 
Ken Fuller was the brother of band manager Simon Fuller, and that script, cribbed heavily from the Beatles' A Hard Day's Night, is what was filmed. It shot from June to August, and then the band was off to do more recording, touring, and promotion. After all, there was a record to get out alongside the film, and both of those things would happen in less than six months. The good news was, the ladies wrote most of the music for the upcoming album during shooting of Spice World, so, you know, easy. The movie comes out in the United States in January of 1998, and it became the biggest opening Super Bowl weekend for a movie ever. Spice World remains the highest grossing movie by a musical group of all time. Plans were already underway for a sequel when the inevitable happened. Tastes were shifting and the no questions asked marketing of Spice Girls had the members selling everything from Pepsi to Cadbury to UK supermarket chains. The group set records in lending their name along with all the other records the Spice Girls shattered the brand applied for over 100 trademarks in 1997 alone. Now, even as this business of Spice Girls was booming, record sales were starting to slip. And in May of 1998, Jerry Hollowell, Ginger Spice herself, announced via her lawyer that she would be leaving the group. The reason that she gave was exhaustion, but in the endless entertainment news that swirled around the fracturing of the biggest group since, well, the Beatles, it was suggested that an internal struggle over control of the band between Spice's Ginger and Scary might have had something to do with it. The rest of the group vowed to continue and managed to set another record along the way, nailing three consecutive number one singles at Christmas. The previous record holder, you guessed it, The Beatles. While the remaining members of the group worked to redefine their image, the world largely moved on. Their next ginger spiceless effort would land around number 39 on the US charts, which is not so great. Speaking of redefining, Spice Girls were given a Lifetime Achievement Award from the 2000 Brit Awards, an event notably gingerless as well. After poor reception to an R&B style album called Forever, Spice Girls went their separate ways. One, you might say, became five. There was a reunion on their 10th anniversary and again on the 20th and in 2007 and 2017 respectively, and members have come and gone over time in these reissues of the group, but even a new album couldn't recapture the magic of that first go-round when they were the Fab Five and they were breaking record after record with a message of genuine positivity. And you know, there are worse legacies to have. But speaking of legacies, what about the movie they leave behind? Is it really an entertainment-free void like frequent Pick 6 contributor Roger Ebert suggested? Well, the only way to find out for sure is to get Chad in here and find out, as once more two become one. Ladies and gentlemen, Mel C's and Mel B's, it's 1998's Spice World. Hey there, folks, and welcome to a, a very special episode of Pick 6 Movies tonight. I, uh, of course, am your host, Bo Ransdell, with me, uh, as ever, the uh, effervescent Chad Cooper. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Bo. I don't normally like to begin the show this way, mm -hmm. but we want to start with a warning. Uh, now, a lot of you are going to be tempted to gamble uh, on this episode. Chad, you know that I, I interact with a lot of, of bookies and bookmakers, Mm -hmm. Do you have a problem? I I do have a crippling gambling problem, yes. And admitting it is not the first step to recovery, because you've admitted this for decades. I've never you've, denied haven't it. You've come close to recovery. Yeah, I haven't. I never once considered stopping, Chad, to be honest. It's sad how much you flaunt it. Once people started giving me the Christmas gifts and stuff, that's when it took on a life of its own. It's like when you tell somebody you like ducks, and then you just get duck shit the rest of your life that's how i am with gambling the point being chad that a lot of uh, notable bookmakers have have said this is hands down the odds on favorite to be the shortest episode of pick six movies ever i would agree with that it will be the shortest episode we've ever done 
So I just want to warn people at home, don't get duped. Don't let this turn into a sting situation <laughs> where somebody's running the con on you, uh, and probably with some sort of teletype. But this movie <laughs> yeah. is utter nonsense. This movie is the worst movie this podcast has ever reviewed. And I don't say that hyperbolically. It is. This movie has brought this podcast in two short weeks to a place that is simply unimaginable. And if you're wondering where we are today from when we finished Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park ended, look, there were a lot of us that on the, the day that we announced we were going to do this movie, they were deeply skeptical and worried about what a Spice World movie review would be. But this is a moment of unparalleled humiliation. When you watch Spice World, these are the musings of an imbecile, an idiot. And I don't use these words to name call. I use them because these are the precise words of the English language to describe this movie. Its comportment, its actions, we've never seen this level of incompetence, a level of ineptitude so staggering on a cinematic basis by anybody in the history of motion pictures. Sometimes I get really worked up and I just channel my inner Steve Schmidt, do a little search and replace. <laughs> Trump for Spice World. It's amazing Donald Trump is not in Spice World, in retrospect. that It's incredible that that cameo did not happen. I 100% agree. Holding a two-liter bottle of Pepsi and a Pizza Hut deep dish supreme with hot dogs stuffed in the crust or some shit. Chet, let me tell you something. I watched the trailer for Spice World today, and in that trailer, they conclude by the way there are scenes in the trailer that aren't in the movie which is always a good sign they conclude the trailer with you can get this soundtrack on not one but two records <laughs> like that's a positive and also right below that is and check out the spice world tour 1998 everybody so they knew from jump this is the he-man and the masters of the universe of music movies where we have the toys now let's make the shit that's going to sell the toys yeah a commercial that you pay 10 bucks to go see <laughs> it is yes i don't even think we can discuss this movie the way we normally discuss terrible movies on our podcast criticizing this film is like when those theater reviewers go in and critique children's christmas pageants like, it's not fair to beat up on something that is so far below what normal people would consider to be passable entertainment. This does feel in a lot of ways like Baby's first movie, where everyone involved, <laughs> down to like writers, directors, the cast, it was everyone's first time at bat, and everyone's aiming over their heads. I will talk to you about this movie for the next hour or so, but it's not going to be fun, like we normally have. <laughs> Nobody, look, nobody's having a good time here. It's going to be like giving a deposition or a statement to a police officer about that time you saw a circus train crash into a bus filled with a children's orchestra. Your Honor, permission to treat my co-host as a hostile co-host this honk, evening. Honk. <laughs> All right, let, let's get into it because to to describe Spice World is to just tell you here's what happens in it. There's no discernible story. It is no, it is just stuff that happens. And so yes. we begin our movie with some stuff happening. The first stuff that happens is that uh, we see the Spice Girls kind of dancing in profile in this kind of color, almost James Bond-esque color profile. Yeah, it's this psychedelic interpretation of Bond. To their hit song, Too Much. And it's all the the Spice Girls kind of looking sultry. And we got them all, Chad. You got you got your baby. You got your scary. Mm -hmm. uh, you got your sporty. You got your ginger. And you got your posh. These opening credits feel like a 90s sitcom where each of the primary players turn around and they're happily surprised that the camera snuck up on them. <laughs> Strike that. It's not that. It feels like a 1-900 phone sex line commercial. It's all sultry and sexy. And we got these, you know, British songbirds looking around, giving you sex eyes. And What you're describing is 87% the fault of Posh Spice 
uh, who is, you know, Victoria, now Beckham, Victoria Adams, uh, I think was uh-huh. her original name. And every look she has in this movie wavers between pissed off and confused. And the, her sultry is halfway in between those. You're describing me watching this movie, Bo. <laughs> As they're singing and dancing, you're seeing the cast list roll by, and it's like, Richard Grant, Alan Cummings is in this. Huh. George Went, Mark McKinney. And I'm like, I like all of these people, and I have seen all of them in good movies. Alan Cumming. Yes. Who was Nightcrawler in those X-Men movies. Yeah. You think he had a tougher childhood than Anthony Weiner? Um, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> First of all, Alan Cumming is charming as hell. You gotta be with a last name like Cumming. Well, and also, it kind of plays in your favor, Chad. You know? Does it? Yeah. Oh, look, Alan Cumming. You're right. Right in your mother's vagina. (laughs) That's where Alan's been coming, eh? I think you can turn that, and I think he's clever enough to do it. I I think he's very funny. I laughed one time in this movie, both times I watched it, and it's the same time, and it's because of Alan Cumming. I had one time that I laughed out loud, and I'll let you know when it happens. Yeah, mine's way on the back end, so don't even worry about it right now. Mine's when Ginger Spice kicks that dance instructor in the ass with her giant boot. Spoiler alert. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> you you must have just been punch struck by that point. Hell yeah, strike punch, yeah. So they're performing in front of this crowd. There's some like a mini orchestra with violins playing behind them. The crowd's hooping and hollering. And then Alan Cumming, it turns out, uh, speak of the Nightcrawler, he's a documentarian and he is the host and director, presumably. And it's him and his sound guy in the crowd. And this is about the time that the credit pops up that says, based on an idea by Kim Fuller and Spice Girls. An idea, Bo. Yeah. That's a new one. I really like that, because that's that sums up this movie perfectly. Based on a notion. Based on a fleeting thought. Based on a figment of your imagination. Hold on, I got another one. Based on a hint of whimsy. Based on a fortune cookie. Based on bathroom graffiti. Based on something I saw on toilet paper. I'm done. It's a long list. <laughs> but that feels right. That feels about as far as, as they got with the planning of this movie. Is like, uh-huh. man, I've got an idea. Great. Let's start filming next week. One of the problems I have with this movie, one of the many problems I have with this movie, is how it really pushes the whole girl power concept. But the whole movie, they're just constantly being told what to do, when to do it, how to do it by a bunch of men. Well, but that's the journey of the characters through the film, Chad, is that oh, they, Jesus Christ. All, they, right. all of that is totally backloaded. You're right, but they also just fuck off whenever they feel like it, so I don't know how oppressed they are, because <laughs> they just kind of wander around in the movie. Speaking of, like, they finish the song, they go backstage, and Clifford, Richard E. Grant, a.k.a. the guy with the jangling testicles from L.A. Story. Mm-hmm. A movie that I could watch any day of the week, unlike this film. <laughs> And he is kind of a, a smarmy, just a, a music manager type, right? Like, he, he's just kind of oily and, and a little pissed off through the whole movie. My notes say psychopathic misogynist, but okay. Sure. I said music agent, Chad. <laughs> we really get to see a lot of layers of his assholery as this thing rolls along. He's tall and thin. He's got a soul patch on his chin and these crafted sideburns Mm -hmm. that come down at a hard angle and they protrude out to the middle of his cheeks. You put a pair of sunglasses on him and a joint in his mouth and he fits perfectly behind a set of jums and a jazz trio. His hairstyle, his facial hair is very like Captain Cocaine Roo. (laughs) and as they're going down the hallway we see alan coming and his group and he's like we're about to spend five days with the spice girls and they're about to walk down this very hallway None of that matters. It, of course The five not. days don't matter. The framing device as a documentary doesn't matter. You think it's going to, but it doesn't. Other movies have made that matter, like Life Aquatic, Albert Brooks's Real Life, you know, mm-hmm. The Blair Witch Project, but that, didn't, that was, what, a year after this that it came out? That feels and right. And dare I say Spinal Tap, but puh, puh, get the word Spice World <laughs> right. out of my mouth <laughs> at the same time I'm saying Spinal Tap. Don't you ever... Ever say Spinal Tap on this Spice World show again. I'm so sorry. 
<laughs> stop hitting me, Bo. I'll stop it when the echo of the good, the fine name of Spinal Tap has stopped <laughs> ringing in my ears. And not until then. Are you going to hit me when you stop at 11? <laughs> You wish you don't deserve that kind of punnery. How many slaps have I done? Uh, like 20. Oh, yeah. That's our setup for the, the gag that's about to happen, Chad. Oh, and I want to use this as an example. The, the reason I point this out is there's this big deal about right down this hallway, the Spice Girls are about to come. We cut over the Spice Girls who run into Elton John, who is in this movie for about, I don't know, 14 seconds more than I am. Yeah, he just waltzes in, and they exchange European kisses, Uh huh. and then Elton John immediately waltzes out of the movie. I don't know if there's a joke. Uh, maybe the joke is all the lipstick on his face. Goodbye, Elton John. We're the girls of the Spice movie proud. You can't stick around in the picture. You got something else to do now. Elton John was probably on the way to his apartment and happened upon the film. And they were like, oh my God, Elton John. He was like, what the fuck is all this? Let me tell you how to watch this movie and enjoy it. Legitimately. On, on ayahuasca. No, no, no. Oh. If you're not high, here's how oh. you watch this movie and you enjoy it. Assume that this movie was made the same way the feature film in Bowfinger was made, where none of the cameos are aware of the fact that they're in a film, and it becomes much more entertaining, that they've somehow tricked them into being in this movie. The Elvis Costello one in particular feels like that probably happened. <laughs> like he was just like bartending for some benefit, and it will get to it, but it is the craziest shit. As someone who has seen Elvis Costello live at uh -huh. least five times. <laughs> what are you doing in this movie? In interviews, people asked him that question. And he was just like, I don't know. They asked me to do it. I have no idea why they asked me. <laughs> I just thought it would be kind of a goof. But it's not like the Blues Brothers or the Muppet movie. Where he performs or something. Right. But but even the eclectic nature of, oh, you've got Orson Welles or, oh, you have Aretha Franklin, where the strangeness of it seems to align with the overall artistic vision. This is just a bunch of haphazard weird shit that <laughs> goes down. And it don't make no sense at all. It's like cameos by people that I had to look up like, that's clearly a cameo. Yeah. Yeah. Who is that? And you're like, oh, they were in Up the Down Staircase and won a BAFTA award. I don't... All right. You're you're right about all of that. But anyway, so we have the Elton John moment. And then we cut back to Alan Cumming, who again is repeating the setup. Any second now, the Spice Girls are going to be coming down this hallway. And then they walk right behind him. Uh -huh. And then he stares daggers at the camera and he's like, I thought we talked about this. I, th I thought they were going to come down this hallway. And they were like, no, you just told us that. And we thought you knew. And that's, again, the joke. None of that is in my notes. I just skipped over all that because it's a bunch of stupid shit that don't matter. That's the thing is like there are all these set up and punchline kind of moments in the movie. I guess at the basis level, there is a joke there. But there isn't an ounce, not even an ounce, there's not a gram of cleverness to be had in this movie. No, it's like listening to a five-year-old tell you a knock-knock joke that they fuck up. And you're just like, this is the most basic joke ever, you yeah. know? You told the joke wrong, and it's why did the chicken cross the road? Knock-knock, who's there? Aren't you glad I didn't say banana? No! Wrong! wrong. Fuck it up! The Spice Girls and Clifford bust out of this studio, and they're signing autographs. There's a bunch of kids there. and Clifford, their manager, tells one of the members of the paparazzi, who's holding a camera way down low and pointing it up to take pictures, Clifford says, not off the skirts, thank you. And I'm like, wait a minute. This movie came out in January of 98. Princess Diana died being pursued by the paparazzi in August the year prior. So the predatory behavior of the paparazzi was very top of mind when this movie came out, right? Yeah, I would think so, yes. 
Because the paparazzi, th- that used to be a thing. And then now nobody gives a shit because everybody's got a camera and we're all taking pictures of ourselves, I guess. We also get introduced to our assistant band manager, Deborah, who was another one of those people who had appeared in a BBC production called Secrets and Lies. Her name's Claire Rushbrook. And you can tell that this actress is really slumming it in this production. Yes. She's just like, yeah, I- I'll be in this slop house. But so is Richard Grant and Alan. Like, everybody in this movie is way better than the material other than the spice girls themselves yes it's very strange that so many talented actors are in this movie when they clearly shouldn't have been i don't know if they were just sort of either early in their careers or attaching their wagon to the pop culture phenomena that was the spice girls but neither here nor there so (laughs) the spice girls go past their fans and they make their way onto this double decker spice bus that's wrapped top to bottom with the union jack and on the back there's a giant peace symbol and once inside the bus we see that the interior is like the TARDIS from Doctor Who. Did I make that reference correctly? That's right, yes. Yes, that was just for you. I've never seen Doctor Who. I'm a David Tennant guy. (laughs) This face is massive. It's like something out of Harry Potter, which is fun and silly. And quite honestly, this movie needed more of that with all of this topsy-turvy surrealistic nonsense and just sort of lean into this magically abstract absurdity. But they don't do that successfully for the, what, 87 minutes? that you're forced to sit through this combination of audio and visuals i cannot (laughs) call it a movie it defies that description among many others again because this movie has not a wit of cleverness when they get on the bus all of the girls immediately start doing the thing that they're known for like Mm -hmm. baby spice gets in a swing and sucks on a lollipop in a really uncomfortable way Uh uh sporty spice jumps on her exercise bike uh posh spice starts trying on dresses ginger spice she sits on this couch that looks like a pair of big red lips and starts reading horoscopes yeah and then scary spice aka the only non-white member of the spice girls uh-huh, Mel B. she goes to her area that really helps to give her a sense of identity which is a zebra striped room yeah i know she wears a lot of animal print clothes and shit and i can't tell how racist that is the fact that she is identified as the black one we know which one you are yeah it, there's a lot of weird subtle racist stuff in this and we'll we'll touch on that in a moment i did notice that scary spice has a pierced tongue stud uh-huh which when i got my first real job in a real work environment i worked alongside a girl who had a tongue stud and we became friends and i asked her why she got her tongue pierced and she said to me and i quote because it makes fellatio so much better And all I could think of when she told me this was, wow, you must give a lot of blowjobs to invest in such a oral upgrade. Look, everyone's got their hobbies, Chad. She wore a lot of patchouli and she was a bit of a weirdo. So I never really pursued any additional details in that realm. There are non-zero odds too that could have been a subtle flirtation. And by subtle flirtation, I mean obvious and uh, direct come on. She was the one who introduced me to Rotten.com. Oh. While we were at work on work computer. So. That part I understand. Rotten.com though. That's rough to be like, hey, you know what you ought to look at? You're you're making a judgment call. You're assuming something about a person (laughs) by recommending Rotten.com. That's a quick like fbi quantico profile of you that's like yeah he's a rotten.com guy (laughs) he wouldn't mind seeing some suicide photos by the way other domains that will redirect you to rotten.com include oh my god.com and holy shit.com as well as mormon.com which is weird i don't know why but it does We're on the bus and Clifford and the Spice Girls are all there and he screams out to the bus driver, Dennis, get us to Albert Hall! And we see that the man behind some of the greatest rock ballads of all time, Meatloaf, is driving the bus. Mm. And Bo, the Spice Girls are cold boogers on a paper plate compared to the rock and roll musical impact of Meatloaf. He's driving their bus? How dare you, Spice World? I mean... Bad Out of Hell's good. Bad Out of Hell 2 is great. It is not great. You put up the collected works of Meatloaf against the collected works of the Spice Girls? Yeah. It's not even a fair contest. I mean, I like two Meatloaf songs. 
songs. And that's only like one more than the Spice Girls. Paradise <laughs> by the Dashboard Lights? It, yeah, that's one of the two. It's it's that and two out of I three would do bad. anything for love. No, that song rapper- is garbage. It's <laughs> awesome. Yes, and Van Hagar <laughs> is the better Van Halen. Yes. Let's all <laughs> let's all give up our soul and just listen to the most overproduced <laughs> bullshit we can find, people. Quick sidebar. Jim Steinem wrote the majority of Meatloaf's songs, and he also wrote a lot of Air Supply songs. Yeah, I don't like Air Supply either. I think Jim Steinem is a bad writer. There, I said it. <laughs> Hot takes Ransdale serving him up fresh daily. Jim St- <laughs> Jim Steinem is a hack. <laughs> what? He's probably not a hack. That's probably a step too far. I got excited, but I do think he's a bad songwriter. I think Air Supply music is generally really bad, and I think Me Love music is generally really bad, with some exceptions because some of them are hilariously bad. Two out of three ain't bad is a hilariously bad song. Baby, You're So Cold I'm Crying Icicles Instead of Tears is a deeply stupid line of music, but it's also hilarious. He he wrote Making Love Out of Nothing at All. Uh, All right. (laughs) I mean, if you want to go to a roller rink circa 1982 and get yourself with a couple skate. All revved up, no place to go. There are people who enjoy the easy listening, and there are people who don't, and never the twain shall meet. Although we could very easily just discuss our favorite music for i don't know the next 70 minutes or so and call it a night i'm okay with that or uh we could finish talking about this movie (sighs) let's finish talking about the movie this whole scene on the bus culminates in a pillow fight then we go to an open air (laughs) stage where the spice girls uh, are, are doing kind of a press event where they announce that in one week's time they will be playing uh, at the Albert Hall, and it's going to be broadcast all over the world. And they, they say, how many countries is it going to be broadcast in? And Scary Spice says, oi, I'm Scary Spice. Millions, maybe more. And everybody's like, oh my God, Scary Spice, we love you. Then we, we cut from that to see Norm from Cheers. Norm! It, <laughs> he's watching them on television and eating buffalo wings or something or maybe that was just my fantasy i think so but he's like hey these girls are adorable get in here mark mckinney star of kids in the hall (laughs) join me as i objectify these five women one by one oh yeah it's a real like i like sporty spice i like baby spice the best how about we both just jerk off in front of each other yeah mark mckinney doesn't even dignify baby spice by calling her that he's like "Mm, i like the blonde one i refer to her as the blonde one because giving her a name provides her a sense of identity let's just refer to them by their hair color or their physical attributes it's not racist if i say the black one's the sexiest one is it yeah it kind of is norm's like i like sporty spice because she has that tongue stud i heard it's good for fellatio and then george went norm (laughs) says hey this is what our movie should be about cliffy they're young and cute and hip and wacky and mark mckinney says can they act and george went norm he says did anyone care if marilyn monroe could act we're only capitalizing on these women's sexuality we're not gonna make a quality motion picture no shit and he's like we'll pitch the movie this afternoon and then mark mckinney is like uh listen there normie uh i'm just wondering listen we've been pitching all over town interesting fact about pitching only one out of 317 pitches that is actually picked up uh, by the studio there normie this movie openly exploits the spice girls while at the same time tries to negate the exploitation of the spice girls it kind of argues with itself as it rolls along but i think that's true of the spice girls in general is like hey here are these five really attractive singer dancers that are gonna dress pretty provocatively the whole baby spice thing is creepy as shit yep and then you've got you know the whole thing was like the black one is scary spice that's real uncomfortable for me yep like there's just a lot of problematic shit but also there is this overarching message of female empowerment and self-determination and all that stuff and it just teaches you that there is such a thing as nuance a thing can be both good and bad at the same time are you saying this movie is nuanced no 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 i'm saying the spice girls as a as an act as an artist 
it can be both good and bad because as performers the way they were marketed was certainly on their sexuality as much as their their talent why is this the only famous girl band well you know diana ross and the supremes was pretty famous yes but that's different that was a lead singer and a a backup sure the go-go's no i think they were a real band i'm talking about where somebody where somebody places an ad and says hey we're casting types and you're gonna be the bad boy and you're the funny one and you're the handsome one and you're the smart one and you're the quite possibly gay one like that kind of thing like where you put it together because boy bands as as a musical entity is a thing they, they ruled the land in the 90s yeah not in this country but in like japan and korea that's of course a thing it is giant they tried to push some of those onto the american and european audience you know when in the height of mm-hmm. backstreet boys and nsync there were a few of those that came out but they just never took off i just think that guys don't give a shit you know in vogue destiny's child i mean there there's a handful but they yeah. n- not not one with any kind of saying power but then again how many boy bands i think the real rule here is that if you are assembling a group of artists by marketing which you know spice girls were as you heard in the introduction and you know all these boy bands kind of are that it's just a recipe for the band eventually imploding because they're not coming together because they're friends or they have a shared love of music or anything like that they're coming together because they all want to be famous and that's why the Spice Girls broke up. That's why NSYNC broke up. That's why One Direction, all that shit. Somebody got more famous. Somebody got jealous. They all fucking go their separate ways. You can hear more about all of this on my new podcast, Why the Bands Broke Up. In every episode, we pick a, a band Mm -hmm. and we don't talk about their music we don't talk about a single positive thing the band ever did right uh by design Uh and instead we just start with the the bad shit you know (laughs) it's like uh an episode of the first 48 but you cut out the all the bullshit about who the victim was right and you just go straight to the murder that's what i'm doing is each episode like 18 seconds long so for example you come in you're like welcome to why the bands broke up uh i'm your host bo ransdell uh this is episode 217 and we're talking about the beatles yoko join us next time when we discuss why the band broke up featuring queen here's a preview he died yeah i try to keep it under three sentences if i can eagles they were all assholes the end see you next week oh shit four sentences guns and roses axel rose yeah yeah axel got fat but sometimes he breaks some news on the show and maybe there's not a lot of room to explain in the three sentence format but sex pistols turns out it was all about a duck see you next week and people are like a duck what maybe we do need some more detail in our podcast but that's just not the show i'm doing Mm mm-mm Nope. What are we talking about here? Oh, yeah, Spice World. Clifford then gets a call from the Chief. As played by your favorite James Bond, yeah. Roger Moore. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you again. I'm even older now, and I have a cat. He literally phones in his performance in this movie. He is always on a phone, he is always alone. <laughs> Mwah. in terms of just like absolutely not giving a shit about what he is doing he does not care hold a cat hold a rabbit hold a pig the whole gag with this chief is that he says these cryptic like koan kind of things where he'll say when the rabbit of chaos is pursued by the ferret of disorder through the fields of anarchy it is time to hang your pants on the hook of darkness whether they're clean or not darling just, it yeah. doesn't make any sense. It's not funny. You're, you're, that's the whole movie we're watching. Yeah. Every time they cut to him, it's some stupid thing like that. The whole thing is Clifford is calling him to say, hey, maybe we need to stir things up. The danger here is that the spice goes, uh, there's going to be a backlash. So how about you let me beat up some paparazzi? Huh? What if what if I shank them? Huh? I've been playing a lot of Assassin's Creed lately, and I've learned the subtle art of st- 
stabbing someone in the kidney to get the dark blood as they're walking through a crowd. No one notices you, Chief. No one even sees you. Clifford says, perhaps I should seek professional help on a variety of issues. Do you want me to go after the paparazzi, Chief? I could start kicking asses if you'd like. I'd start with those bastards who plucked our English rose. Princess Diana! Goodbye, England's rose. May you ever grow in our heart. You're the grace that plays itself with the lives of tore apart. Elton, get out of here! We're not paying you two days. Get out of here, Elton. Called out to your conscience. Shooing him out with a broom. And you whispered to those in pain. Now you belong in heaven. And the stars spell out your name. And it seemed to me you lived your life like a candle in the wind. Never fading with the sunset when the rain set in. Elton, you get out of here. Shoo, Elton, shoo. I remember when Baby Spice was young. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get him out. Put bricks on top of the trash cans, too. He causes a mess everywhere he goes. Here's how you know Roger Moore is really slumming it in this movie. And, like, he was kind of slumming it in Cannibal Run. This is a new depth of slumming here. Because at one point, Richard Grant says, uh, Clifford says, Would you like me to shake things up? Roger Moore pours a martini and says at the same time, No reason to shake things up. And you're like, uh, God. It is maybe the smartest joke of the movie, but... Anyway, but it's just embarrassing for everybody involved. <laughs> Including the audience. This is one of the few times where I was watching this and I was like, God, if somebody saw me through the window watching this movie, I would feel ashamed. It, yes. Clifford gets overexcited. He ends up hanging up with the chief. Deborah, his assistant, is like, what did the chief say? And he's like, I have no idea. But I think he wants me to kill Deborah. I've got a murder boner. I'm going to go murder someone. Then we cut back to the Spice Girls who are now in a studio practicing the song You'll Be There. If you don't know the song, you probably know it if you heard it. This is maybe one of their catchier songs, I yeah. think. You hear it in the grocery store a lot. So Alan Cummings is coaching his crew. We we have to take our viewers into the subconscious of the Spice Girls. And again, what passes for jokes in this movie, the guy holding the boom says, I'm going to need a longer lens to get into the subconscious. Get it? All right. Oh, Christ. <laughs> And then the Spice Girl, here's where I, like, th this is the kind of shit that I kind of bristle on the idea that they're being oppressed throughout the movie. Uh -huh. They turn around and just berate a dude who screws up in their band. Oi! You fucking piece of shit. You're fucked up on the keyboard. What, are you wearing boxing gloves or something? Oh, yeah. this guy who screwed up to so bother you. I'm going to take this giant boot of mine and stick it straight up, you wrecked him. Oi, somebody hold him down. Scary, get on him. I got him down. Give me your lipstick. I'm going to paint his face like a little girl. Yeah, you like looking like, like a little, a little girl. girl. Girl power. Scary. Get over here and kick him right in his asshole. When their pregnant friend just wanders onto the set. Yeah, um, Nicola. She shows yeah. up and both she is eight months and 27 days pregnant. Well, she says she's overdue by like a week. They all crowd around and rub her belly, which is full of baby. And one of the Spice Girls says, Oi, how's Trevor? How's his baby's daddy? Um, he's gone. He was irresponsible, but now he's gone and proved it. Oi! Oi, God! Get my lipstick! Folks, boy! You want to go after him? We'll make I, him regret ever meeting you, we will. I got a tar iron and two bricks that I took off the trash cans outside. Hey, get! Shoot, Elton! Shoot! I want spice. Just yeah. a different kind. I want spice. Won't let me in. Won't let me watch. Won't let me sing. I want a spice. Get out of here, Elton. <laughs> you think all of this baby stuff's going to matter, and it really doesn't. No, absolutely not. But as they gather around, this is where the movie reveals its <laughs> true stripes. That it's just a really, really unfunny episode of Family Guy. It's like Family Guy but if all the cutaways were written by a bunch of moms that were at a church retreat. Oh, geez, Marge. I got a good one here. Okay, so here's what happens. Uh -huh. Nicola, uh -huh. she's the pregnant girl, Oh, right? yeah. Well, she tells the Spice Girls, oh. she says, she says, hey, I wonder what it'd be like if you lot had babies, because that's how they talk in, in England. Oh, yeah. They call them you lots. Uh -huh. and, and then... We just go right to a comedic scene. 
where all the Spice Girls are there, and they've had some sort of, of child or in the process of, of childbirth or, or being pregnant, and they have a lot of makeup. There's Ooh. going to be clothes yeah. draped along lines hanging in the house. Oh, March, you remember when we used to watch the Sanford and Son? You remember how sometimes they'd hang the laundry just right there in the living room? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be some of that. And they're huh? irresponsible, moms? They're going to be real irresponsible. Some of them are going to be drinking. You mean like sugar-flavored drinks? I mean alcohol. You remember Ooh. that time that we were at the potluck yeah. and we saw Janie Sutherland. And oh, Janie geez. Sutherland, she knew she was pregnant. She was two months pregnant. I Everybody knew that. it. She didn't tell anybody because, you know, you like to wait. But we you knew. You could tell she was glowing. Oh, she, her hair looked so good. I used to tell her she had a coat like a husky. I saw her sneak a glass of wine. Hand to God. I'm not trying to tell tales out of, out of school here. But Janie Sutherland was two months pregnant and had a glass of wine. That is That is the gospel truth. I'm not surprised her father was an alcoholic and her mom always swapped out margarine for butter whenever she made her famous snickerdoodles. Like you can't tell the difference. I can tell the difference. Of course you can. Everyone can. So I keep telling her, you need to talk to your mother, Janie. She's becoming a laughing stock at the potlucks. Everyone knows it's margarine and she's looking them in the eyes and saying it's butter. It's a scandal. You know, she had that baby and that child can't count past seven now. Was it ever able to? Let's face it, it was a dim baby. It was a dim baby, and it was ugly. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. So all the babies the Spice Girls have, they're ugly too. So it'll be quite the funny scene. All these Spice Girls in this Family Guy cutaway are just shitty moms, and then it cuts back to the movie. It's not funny. There's honestly no real jokes in it. It no. sort of exaggerates their characters' personas. Sporty Spice is fat and on an exercise bike, and Posh is an asshole who sends her kids to a boarding school, and she's drinking or something. And Yeah, just sends them away. Oi! I don't want to look at you! Right. Before we leave this hilarity, a ginger Spice grab a broom handle and bangs the ceiling and goes oi bruce dimmy keep it bloody down which you're like oh <laughs> a bruce willis and dimmy Moore reference from the 90s how timeless it's like shrek only awful or oh god it's so bad i like the first shrek i like watching farquad jerk off and um you just enjoy masturbation porn I like what I like. So when we go back to Nicola and all the Spice Girls, uh -huh. the Spice Girls then are just like, Oi, fuck off, Nicola. And then go start rehearsing again. Oi, you're our best friend and you're having a baby. But we gotta go over here and do what the man says. They just play You'll Be There For Real. Yeah, it's a more up-tempo version. And all yeah. I'm wishing for is a few bars of rock and roll all night. Cut to the <laughs> Muppet movie portion of our movie. Mm -hmm. where a spinning paper announces that the Spice Girls are set to conquer the globe. Da -da 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 -da. And we cut inside the offices of the Daily Event, where yeah. the editor... Kevin McMaxford, as played by Barry Humphreys, who was the 90s cross-dressing sensation Dame Edna. He also right. did the voice for Bruce the Shark in Finding Nemo. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. You can tell that he's a comic actor j just trying to chew some scenery. Yeah. He's kind of a Rupert Murdoch media mogul type. And when he screams and yells, a lot of spit comes out of his mouth. And when I say a lot of spit comes out of his mouth, think Turner and Hooch levels of dog saliva emitting from a man's mouth as he talks. Yeah, a lot of jowl. So he's arguing with this reporter of his. But, oi, these Spice Girl he are getting headlines. Who cares if they could climb Mount Everest on ostrich or we maybe find a cure for deja vu? And who cares that they found a cure for deja vu? We gotta take these Spice Girls down the peg. They send out the paparazzi to get some dirt on them. And we'll get that live show on Friday canceled. And we'll break up the Spice Girls. Cause my newspaper made them a success and I can bring them down. And so it what? starts raining on the reporter, which I know sounds like a crazy thing. In the office, rain starts pouring down and lightning and thunder starts happening. And the, this reporter, what, what's his name? Brad. Brad says, I will find someone to break up the Spice Girls. And you think that's going to be the plot, but it's not. 
No, it's just some shit that happens periodically uh-huh. in the movie, as all of this is. And so we go to the Spice Bus, uh-huh. where Clifford is making an announcement about, Please, keep the face cream out of the refrigerator. I mistook it for mayonnaise and accidentally ate it, which drove me into a murderous frenzy. You bitches! I'll kill you all! Katunk. And there's uh, some business about Ginger Spice and Scary Spice playing chess, and Scary Spice doesn't know how to play, so she makes up her own rules. And then Ginger Spice says, I'm going to slap you, oi! That's how their game of chess ends, with her threatening to slap her bandmate. That's right. Let's cut to an outdoor cafe where George Went, Norm, and Mark McKinney, they're pitching the Spice Girls movie to mm-hmm. band manager Clifford, who is 100% dressed like the Riddler from Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Mark McKinney pitches a movie and he says, Hey, you see, uh, uh, it's about these five girls and they're all sisters, see? And uh, they live at this home and they uh, they struggle here, Normie, to uh, take care of an elderly grandmother. And uh, Mel C, I guess, she wants to be uh, uh, an Olympic skier. Funny fact about Olympic skiers, the phrase getting out over your skis actually has nothing to do with skiing itself. It actually has to do with Herb Ha Skieter, who was a German physicist that would actually drive drink so much that when he would get out over the top of his children, he sometimes fell and killed one of them. Maybe you want to keep that last part to yourself there, Mark. What do you think, Sammy? Pretty good story. Huh? It stinks! You know you I'll kill you all! And the Spice Girls! I'm filled with rage! When he comes in, <laughs> Clifford is like, hey, Normie, what's going on? And he says, hey there, Clifford, let's talk about what's going in, Normie. And then orders the beer. That's a a cheers joke. (laughs) Yeah, he says it sucks. And Norm says, hey, it's a start, all right? That's just a place for us to start. We can build off this. Uh, We're just uh, workshopping. Then on the bus, there's some interview uh, with them that the Spice Girls are watching. Right. This sets them off talking about how Baby Spice can get away with anything. Uh Uh-huh. Because she looks like an adult child who appeals to pedophiles. (laughs) <laughs> right so we cut to house md as uh some sort of Hercule Poirot kind of character oh genie i got a great idea for a little cutaway all right oh, so you geez. know how over on pbs on masterpiece theater they do those things where the people who talk funny they come in and they solve mysteries oh yeah what if we were to cut away and a guy who kind of looks like sherlock holmes but he worked in a hospital what if he was a detective and oh, <laughs> it's so obvious that this young little blonde girl is the murderer because she's coming covered in bullets and knives and she's got guns oh that is a stitch she's obviously the killer but then because she bats her eyes at him and she gives him a little wink he points at somebody else that is the funniest joke that is so clever i thought of it the other day when i was shopping for a birthday card for my niece who's turning nine and just something about it just struck me odd when i was looking through some of the hilarious riddles that you find inside birthday cards you know when i was turning in some of the pages for the screenplay Uh uh-huh i thought it would be so funny to do a joke just like the family circus. Oh. I had a whole scene that I gave to the Spice Girls there. Oh. It was a sporty spice. Right. And she was standing over a broken cookie jar. <laughs> the top was still screwed on it, but the cookies had spilled all over the floor there because the cookie jar broke. One of the other Spice Girls, I'm thinking maybe it's it's posh, but maybe she doesn't have the authority, but oh. we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to that point. I'd probably go with scary, but go on. But I was worried it would be too scary. So they look at Sporty Spice and they say, hey, Sporty Spice, who broke the cookie jar? And she says, no one. And then we see a little invisible boy running out of there with a little sign that says, no one. You know what's so funny about that? The other night on my way home from work, I hit and killed a kid who looked like Billy from the family circus. And I didn't even stop. I think his ghost is probably hanging out on the side of the road. He comes and haunts me at night when I try to sleep. Oh, dear. That's the (laughs) Tennyson boy. They've been looking for him. Oh, I know. You keep your mouth shut, you know, or... I'll cut you with my butter knife. You know you don't have to worry about me. I know. 
ever since you helped me bury Ralph. I swore I would always keep any secret you gave me. You've (laughs) never told nobody about that, and that insurance money saved my life. You know that. I do. That's why I can tell you these things. My new favorite characters on the show. (laughs) These UP women who are into some dark shit. We cut back from the scene with Dr. Gregory House, MD, and the Spice Girls are again just complaining like, Oi, everyone always judges us by how we look. It's real stupid. They're always looking at her and they say like, look how she's bit over. I can see her panties. And I'm like, I'm not even wearing panties. Dude, there is a point where Scary Spice is staring at this aquarium. And she goes, Oi, it's fish here. Looks like my old boyfriend. Ah! And just yells at this fish. Like, a uh-huh. hand to God, this happens in this movie. And she's been hanging around with Clifford. Oi, I'm going to cut that fish. Hey, let's cut to a photo shoot where Dominic West, a.k.a. Detective Jimmy McNutty, from the critically acclaimed HBO series The Wire, is a fashion photographer taking photos of the Spice Girls. He's undercover, running a a wire on on the girls, clearly. (laughs) This whole movie feels like a dream that you had, that you're (laughs) trying to describe as it fades, you know, just like, I'm naked in church and then I meet a dinosaur, I can't remember it. McNutty from The Wire was taking pictures of it. What? During this fashion shoot, the Spice Girls decide to give each other new characters as alternatives to the rich, layered, and meaningful ones that they have now. Before we get to this montage, uh huh, this is yet another point in this movie where the photographer McNutty is trying to get pictures and they're like, <laughs> Oi, fuck off then! Where'd you gotta go on our own shopping trip? And just leave the movie for a while. For the photo shoot? Yeah, they leave McNutty because they're like, oh, you suck. And they take off on him and then go somewhere else to do all this dress up shit. When they pitch their new personas, one of them throws out the name Bricklayer Spice. And then Baby Spice says, oi, how about train spotting Spice? I've got myself a terrible heroin addiction I have. I choose life. Huh? This whole thing devolves into a montage of them playing dress up or one of them. I don't know. They're dressed up like as what Jackie O and Elvis and Charlie's Angels, Wonder Woman. They're John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John from Greece. At one point, Scary Spice is dressed up as a Rastafarian and she's also a cave woman, which I'm like a little bit racist. I need somebody smarter than me to explain this. I think you need somebody stupider than you to explain it. And all this is set to the song Saturday Night Divas. It's all a colossal waste of time it does look like they're having fun though playing dress up and just when you think Bo, that that fun time's over we decide to get a second double dip and the fashion shoot moves to a different location where we then get to see all of the spice girls dressed up as each other where sporty spice is dressed as posh spice wearing a small black dress posh spice is dressed as baby spice in a pink baby doll dress ginger spice is sporty spice in an orange and blue adidas running track suit scary spice is ginger spice in tight red pants and a red leather halter top and finally baby spice is scary spice wearing a leopard print bodysuit, a big bushy afro wig and luckily no black face by the skin of her chinny chin chin i was so worried i'm like that. please no blackface please no blackface we've already had stay away joe this season burgess merit of the show's up like ah you need to borrow my tin of what i like to call indian red <laughs> you girls want to come home and see my bull you want to take the skin boat to tuna town <laughs> i'm a racist dirty old man They change back into their regular clothes and then just leave because none of this, nothing in this movie matters. No, nothing in this movie matters. (laughs) <laughs> and back at the newspaper, the reporter, what you say his name is? David? Brad. Brad says, I got just the guy to break up the Spice Girls. What's his name? Is he good? Oh, he's the best. He gives this long line of like dirty and sleazy pictures that this guy took to unseat and humiliate people in government and, and entertainment. He says, Bo, he's the guy who got the picture of Fergie's toe sucking and he got a picture of of a Teletubby taking a shit. And he got photos of Clinton tucking his t-shirt in his underpants. I want to unpack this for a moment. Mm -hmm. One, I'm assuming 
assuming that Fergie is referring to the Duchess of York and not the female member of the Black Eyed Peas, I will give him seeing a Teletubby take a shit or a poo, as he calls it, would be fascinating. As Teletubbies were costume characters from the popular TV show of the same time in the 90s. And vaguely dog-like, and I know how you feel about that. Yeah. I'm still not sure, but I'm very curious how the Teletubbies came to be. And I would, yeah, I would like to watch these dog-like characters take a shit. But the last one is about (laughs) Clinton tucking his shirt into his underpants, which I don't know if that's like a fashion faux pas or a reference to Bill Clinton being a horn dog because Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, their scandal wasn't going to break until a few months after this movie came out. But there was already the, who was, was there Jennifer Flowers in Arkansas? Yeah. So he already had that reputation. I guess so. That was a real, like, he did what? Not Bill Clinton. This movie came out in January, as you Uh mentioned in your intro. That's right. And January is what is affectionately known as dump month when it comes to filmmakers, where they just push out their worst garbage that nobody wants to go see. Present company included. But I I think that in this case, it really was just as soon as we can get the fucking thing out the door. Because they're burning bright and that that star is going to fade quick if right. something happens. Yeah. So as soon as this movie is done, because they're promoting the summer concert with this movie. Gotcha. Kind of like when they put out both Breakin' and Breakin' 2 in the same calendar year. Right. People can't get enough. But anyway, so back in, the, in this office, Brad the reporter introduces this villain of the film theoretically the villain of the film yeah he's this sinister paparazzi photographer riffraff from yeah. rocky horror picture show is right. who it is he just magically appears out of a hiding place in the office and mcmasford he's got pictures of him secret pictures where McFa- mcmasford is sniffing his socks before he puts them on then there's one of him picking his nose in the elevator and then the final photo is of mcmaxford behind a bike stand with eileen winters when he was 12 and eileen winters was the wife of jonathan winters I don't know what this implies that what he and she were up to some hanky panky 50, 60 years ago Uh, with one of the great masters of improvisational comedy, Chad. What a scandal. (laughs) One little nugget that I will point out here that didn't necessarily make me laugh, but I thought it was a good delivery by Riff Raff Uh is when he shows the picture of him picking his nose. He says another bogey breakfast didn't make me laugh. But it was it was a, a bright spot for a moment of hearing someone refer to picking your nose as a bogey breakfast. That's all right. We cut back to the Spice Bus, which is rolling along. And the Spice Bus is constantly in motion in the city of London, I'm guessing. I don't really know geography all that well. Clifford gets over the intercom and he says, After using the shower, please pick clumps of hair from the plug holes. It's hygienic and it can lead to flooding. I'll kill all of you. I will. Gross plug holes. And he's like, up next is a publicity party. You're all going to have fun. That's it. Click. So the Spice Girls show up at this publicity party and they do as they are told always. During this scene, Alan Cumming and his crew show up and they try to get into the party because they're a documentary crew, which doesn't matter to this at all, but they're not on the list, so they don't get to come in. But inside the party, we get to see the Spice Girls talking with different people. For example, Bo, Posh Spice is talking with Jennifer Saunders from the hit sitcom Absolutely Fabulous. This scene is in this movie so that people like you and me can say, hey, that's Jennifer Saunders from the hit sitcom Absolutely Fabulous. Jennifer Saunders is always nice to see. She's a very funny lady. But my favorite cameo in this sequence is one Bob Geldof, Uh lead singer and and songwriter of Boomtown Rats, as well as famously uh, played Pink in Pink Floyd the movie. And he was also behind Band-Aid. Yeah. Live Aid, I think he was... Live Aid. uh, Yeah, he was behind Live Aid. Yeah. He's kind of a big deal. Go look it up. Bob Geldof is a fascinating figure he's a a great humanitarian thinking about bob geldof i've listened to i don't like mondays at least like seven times over the past week the thing with bob geldof is scary says oi i'm gonna do your hair 
Sit down and shut up. Give me my lipstick and my steel toe boots. I'm going to do this guy's hair. Meanwhile, Ginger Spice is at the bar grabbing some dude by the back of the head and is like, Oi, people all the time talking about, hey, how do we come up and approach the Spice Girls, eh? Yeah. And all you got to do is just come up and say hello, huh? Hey, give me my lipstick. Look at this pretty boy right here. Well, I'll tell you what you do, you. You go in that bathroom and you tuck it between your legs up into your ass. And then when you come out, you go into the girl's bathroom and you make a piss, all right? And then you can come and talk to me, a Spice Girl. The whole joke is that he's real intimidated and freaks out. And then we cut over to Bob Geldof, who has been given hair horns and a ponytail by scary spice and he kind of sums up how i felt in the whole movie when he was like the hell'd you do <laughs> jeffer saunders wanders off outside the party nicola their friend who is now eight months three weeks and six days pregnant she shows up and she's got an extra ticket that she gives to alan cumming and his two documentary crew members so they all get into the party and then nicola gathers all the spice girls around and she says you're all my best mates i want you to all be the godmothers of my baby and then all the spice girls i think say yes oi, oi that's a real good cricket then we get to be moms but we don't get you have to get stretch marks we like this all right here's a tuber lipstick and some steel-toed baby boots i stole them off that tiny little girl man over there look at him crying in the fern he's such a tiny little baby man oi nicola where can we fight your baby you want to go over and kick bob guild off right in the cack we can make that happen for you baby I did his hair. He tried to complain. I smacked him in the face. We made him look like a girl we did. I liked his sunglasses, so I took him, and then I threw him on the ground, and I stepped on him in front of him, and you said, Oi, why'd you do that? And I said, I did it because I could, Bob Geldof. Now get down there and lick my boot. So then Deborah, the assistant band manager, she comes over, and she says, Come on, Spice Girls, we got a photo shoot again. So off they go. Nicola's left by herself, and then some guy wanders over, and he says, I'm Barnaby. Are you part of the Spice Girls phenomenon? And she's like, Nah, I'm, I'm just basically a pregnant lady with no husband uh piss off then and so they just leaves her alone like eh, yeah. girl power bo alan cumming is continuing to make his documentary and he starts to ask the spice girls about men in their lives and sporty spice says oi boys they don't ring a bell unless they're dressed up like little girls and we tell them to ring the bell and they gotta do everything we say is sporty spice a lesbian because mel c's not gay it's very odd in this moment that her denying the existence of men implies that slightly slightly but eh you know oi i'm too busy getting jacked to worry about boys huh then alan cummings asks follow-up questions about the boys and all the, all the girls are like oi i wish you could just get on the phone and order them up so that they would come to your room and then you could kick them out when you wanted to i call up room service and i was like hey i know and six tubes of lipstick and 12 pairs of doc mortons and a bunch of Kleenex because I'm going to make them cry like tiny little baby girls. Alan Cummins <laughs> throws it to Ginger Spice, Jerry Hollowell. What about you, Ginger? Do you like boys? Oi, is that Pope fucking Catholic? Which leads to another... Da -da 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 but Riff Raff the whole time was like, oh, I've yeah. been in this food cot the entire time. And like has like a Carmen Miranda fruit display on his head as he pokes up from the cart. There was part of me the first time I watched this that I was like, okay, I'm kind of down with this character that's like, oh, he's their foil who's constantly showing up to fuck them up and at some point they're gonna have to confront him and that kind of thing none of that happens right and it, right it's totally a throwaway but right you get the spinning da -da 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 -da. it's a headline that is like the spice girls aren't sure if the pope is catholic this is as close as this movie gets to any real social commentary or satire because it reminded me of the modern day nonsense like all this shit in the news about dr seuss being canceled and all this mr potato head bullshit it's all this false outrage over a bunch of ginned up controversy that nobody should give a shit about. Right. It's the closest we get to the movie saying something. But I think it was just accidental. I think in this, it was like, oh, Marge, you know what would be funny? Go tell the girls in there who are working on the main script. What if she were to say, is the Pope Catholic? And then they took it for real and they just came down on them like a ton of bricks. 
Oh, that does double duty because on the one hand, it's a funny joke. And on the other hand, maybe some of those people will realize that being a papist is a path to hell. If you're not going to be Lutheran, you might as well just cut your wrists. <laughs> That's what my mother used to tell me. She used to say there, Sally, what I want you to do, if you ever look in the mirror and say to yourself, I'm not a good God-fearing Lutheran, I'd like you to get in that tub and run some warm water and just open up your veins because we don't need you in this family, she used to say. From your mouth to God's ears. Oh, oh, that's what my mom used to say. We we have quite a close following here at this church. Some people have called it a cult. I'd never call it a cult. I know better than that. Sure, you wouldn't last the night once those words came out of your mouth. They'd hunt you down like a dog. They got Shannon that way. Yeah, Shannon. She wasn't a true believer. She was not a true believer. She'd put on her goat leggings one at a time just like you and me, but you know what? She didn't mean it. Oh, no. One time I asked her, when are you going to get around to having that firstborn to sacrifice? Yeah. And she said, you know, me and Joel, we're just not ready to have a baby yet. But you know what? I think she just didn't want to kill it. She's pro-life up until the baby's born. And then after that, you got to do what you got to do. It's just selfish. It's just selfish. Is Some what people is. can't put the needs of the many above the needs of the few. I'll tell you, he who walks behind the rose isn't going to stand for it much longer. Not at all. Why would he? He has blessed us with so many good harvests. For Shannon to act that way, when she went missing, I said good. And I, you know me, I got a heart of gold. I don't want to hurt anybody other than, you know, the firstborns to keep the harvest coming. You know, Shannon was just, she was, boy, dan tap dancing on thin ice, they say. Well, you know, I got to tell you something, and I can't believe it, gosh darn it, that I haven't told you this already, but heck, I'll tell you. I was the one who went in and cut that live baby out of her stomach before it was ready to be born so that we could sacrifice it. Oh, that was you. Thank you so much. My hyacinths are coming in like never before. I know. I'll tell you what. I'm going to take some of the bad things I said about Shannon back. You know what she did? She gave us that good harvest after all, so Paymon bless her. Amen, bless her. That's what I always say, especially after I got a woman and take out her still alive baby as she screams, please don't stop. What are you doing? Oh, but she was always a big mouth. She did have a big mouth. Much bigger now that she's mostly skull, probably. That's for he who walks behind a rose to decide. She can make a hell of a good macaroni salad, though. Credit where credit is due. Back in our movie. Because of this mayhem with the newspaper clifford uh -huh. gets all beside himself and has to call the chief because he is afraid i believe the backlash to the spice girls has begun i'm afraid i'm going to have to kill them and he calls up the chief and then darling when the rabbit of chaos is pursued by the ferret of disorder through the fields of anarchy blah 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 click how much do i get paid for this yeah. mm. how many more phone calls two so we cut to a shot of an airplane flying through the air and we got a text overlay that tells us that this is a flight from London to Milan at 6.30 a.m. And we hear Clifford, the band manager, say, You're going to be in Italy for a TV special! Screaming kids! The usual things! Just shut up! And so we next see the Spice Girls singing their hit song that I'd never heard before, Leader of the Gang, where mm -hmm. a bunch of hairless beefcake comes out to start dancing around behind them wearing white boy shorts, sailor hats, and black boots as though we were in an all-male stripper review. And the Spice Girls, Bo, they don't care about this one bit. They're not really on board for any of this. Not at all. And so the Italian director is like, hey, why you a Spice Girls stop in the middle of the song, eh? I like it to watch them slap the ass and the thighs and the huge peccatoria the muscles. They're so sex, not unlike you women. And so Clifford comes over and is sort of the enforcer here where he's like, listen, you Italian piece of shit. If you don't get those naked men off of this set, I'm going to stab you in the heart. Right in the water. I'm going to do it. No, no, no. The good dancers. All of them. The great dancers. I don't <laughs> fucking care how good the dancing is. I'm going to murder you right here in front of everyone. I'm going to stab you in the heart with a fucking pencil. Sydney. But the girls, meanwhile, are like, looking at all the guys bulges and kind of talking about who's got a big dick and who's just stuffing their shorts right but one of them that baby spice has cornered and she's just like oi let me name off all me stuffed animals huh? 
How creepy is that? I'm dressed up like a little girl, but back in me home in me bed, I got an elephant, I got a giraffe, I got a woody and a buzz, I got a whole bed full of doors. I got lots of stuffed animals, I do, but I'm a grown-up lady. That's what makes it gross. About this time, Ginger Spice comes over and she intervenes between Clifford and the screaming Italian director of this TV show. Oi, how about some compromisation, all right? Can't we all just get along? So then we see the TV special, and then during the airing of, of the show, the beefcake comes out. But this time, instead of wearing sailor hats and boy shorts, they're wearing purple and pink jumpsuits. But then when they spin around, their asses are cut out on the back. That's funny. Yeah. By the way. Go on. If anyone from Saturday Night Live is listening, because I know they aren't, it's not funny when men kiss anymore. No, it's not shocking or anything like that. There was a time on Saturday Night Live, like the Alec Baldwin sketch, when he kissed everyone in the sketch, Mm -hmm. including, I think, a dog and a plant. That was kind of funny. But when I see men kiss on Saturday Night Live now for comedic effect, it's beneath everyone. It's a trope that's time has passed. Let me just get back on my soapbox. Mm -hmm. Watching Archie Bunker get kissed on the cheek by Sammy Davis Jr. is one of the most iconic moments in television comedic history. You do that now, and it don't mean nothing. Right. Like, context is everything. Absolutely. If you want to play a fun game, try to judge, oh, I don't know, any time five years from now by today's moral standards and see what that gets you. Yeah. It's, it's just sh- shifting landscape, et cetera, et cetera. So they they jump back on a plane to London. Yeah, we see the, the same plane flying the opposite direction, and it's now midnight. So what, is Wednesday over? Clock's ticking, Bo. As we count down to the uh, performance at the Royal Hall or whatever, they get on the Spice Buzz, and they're driving at night with meatloaf at the wheel. The girls are like, Oi, we gotta take a piss! So they make Meatloaf pull over to the side of the road. I can see paradise by the dashboard lights. Speaking of, here's a reason that Meatloaf ought to be ashamed of himself. As they go out uh, out into the woods at night to take a piss. Or a shit. Presumably at least one <laughs> will be taking some sort of rabbit style shit out there. <laughs> Clifford goes to confront Meatloaf. Listen, you fix these toilets or I'll kill you. You know I will. You know I've done it. You've helped me bury the bodies. You're not the first bus driver, all right? In fact, you know you're the seventh. You helped me get rid of the sixth. And the eighth will help me get rid of you. I'm always (laughs) looking for a replacement. Is that what you want, Mr. Loaf? He says, fix the toilets, and Meatloaf says, no, listen, you know I love those girls, and I would do anything for them, but I won't do that. Because I would do anything for love. Ugh. I would do anything for love. I would do anything for love. But I won't unclog the Spice Girl shit from the toilets. <laughs> I'll drive you. I'll drive. I'll carry you. I'll carry. There ain't no way I'm ever gonna plunge you. Don't be <laughs> sad. Because poo and pee ain't bad. Don't worry about it. There's a water sports joke later. Don't even sweat it. The girls go out into the woods or train something around and they hear a tuba sound from off in the distance. And then a circular lighting rig appears above them. It's a UFO, Bo. Jesus fucking Christ, Chad. This scene. These aliens show up. Uh Uh-huh. One of them comes over and grabs Scary Spice's left breast. Yeah. And she's like, oi! I'll fucking kill you, I will. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. the aliens want an autograph, and then one of them they rips up. Ch- they want tickets to the show. Well, they want tickets, but they don't have them. So then they settle for an autograph on some paper, and then one of them rips open their shirt so they can autograph their belly. And then Ginger Spice leans in and kisses one on the lips mm-hmm. in that scene. This is the most like half assed Halloween town costumes I've ever seen. As with everything in this movie, it's way cheaper than you think it would be. What was the Meatball sequel that had the alien in it? Was it Me- Meatballs, Meatballs 2? Meatballs 3. No, it was the third one, I thought, with the... Well, maybe it is the second Two one. has the alien, and then the and third, third one has... the point, porn star ghost. Boy, that series <laughs> fell off a cliff. Did it? 
I mean, the first one is good. It didn't have a alien named Meathead, and it didn't have <laughs> a ghost porn star helping a guy get his dick sucked or whatever. Honestly, that feels like a movie we ought to be doing on this show. The story of a ghost porn star trying to get a hapless nerd laid feels like something that's in our wheelhouse. I don't know what that season premise is other than dead porn stars, but perhaps that's it. We might come back to that. I'm going to put a pin in it. Put a pin in Meatballs 3 because there's something there. So th- we go back to, to the van or the bus. They try to tell Clifford and he, he's like, hmm, you're all crazy. You all need some time off. Oi, we saw some aliens, we did. We held him down, Ooh. she kissed one, and then we kicked him in the dick, painted his lips, made him wear a pair of girly panties, and dance around and sing Mary Had a Little Lamb. We all had a laugh about it. Are you sure that just wasn't a local farmer? Because we have gotten those calls. It might have been, but my story is as an alien, and that way I can't be persecuted for it. Isn't that right, Spice Girls? Oi, 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 oi. So Clifford says he's going to call the chief <laughs> and tell the chief that the girls need the morning off. But before he can make the call, darling, the answer's no. The Spice Girls do not get a day off without sacrifice. There's no success, no pain, no pleasure, no something, no something, no something. Click. Clifford then has to go back to the Spice Girls where he tells them, look, I know I told you about four minutes ago that you all needed some time off. Oi, I got my lipstick. You better <laughs> watch what words come out of your mouth next because my Doc Morton is all warmed up and ready to go. Oh, well, it sounds like we're all going to hell tonight. Yeah, you'll meet me there. I'm afraid your shore leave has been cancelled, girls. Oi! Our friend Nicola is having a baby during the course of this movie for some reason. All right, we're not going to miss it. And we think there's a 30% chance one of us is the father. Oi, 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 And so they're like, fuck off. They leave the bus and they're gone for about, I don't know, eight seconds. Yeah, long enough for Clifford to go, God damn it! Clifford, you fucked it up again. Deborah, run me a warm bath and get my razor blades, not the safety ones. Oh, yeah, that was the part I wrote on account of my mother. I was immortalizing her. The girls immediately come back in and they're like, Oi, Clifford, oh, we was just oh, having yeah, a laugh with there, you. Mate. Having a laugh. Look how you started crying. You want to put on a pair of me patties? Eh? Oh. You want to dance around sing Mary had a little lamb like an alien? Eh? Eh? How about you put your finger on your head and just twirl around in a little circle? Oh, I like that. Oh, and you ran me a warm bath. That's a good boy, Clifford. That's why you're our manager. <laughs> the next scene, the Spice Girls, they go to this dance camp that's like a oh, military. Oh, shit. It's like like a every milita- scene is dumber than the next, Chad. <laughs> it's like a military camp for dancing where they are under the instruction of a man named Mr. Step, as played uh-huh. by Richard Martin because Mr. Bean was unavailable. How did Mr. Bean dodge this movie? <laughs> and quite frankly, are- the fact that Eric Idle isn't in this is a stutter. <laughs> he was off making vacation four and a half or something he's doing eddie's tropical adventure and could make the trip back to merry old england for this he's, he's over there working on like national lampoons american shepherd's pie yeah he's the principal in american pie three so mr step he sashays in and just sort of twits around and it's all embarrassing more than it is entertaining and then i think he almost does an al jolson mammy routine but he swaps out the word mammy for mama and then we get another montage set against the spice girls song never give up on a good time where we see the spice girls going through an outdoor obstacle course and this is the only moment where there's a joke that made me laugh because at the end of this obstacle course ginger spice kicks uh mr step in the ass with her great big steel toed boot one thing i will say about this scene that's pretty funny is that posh spice is the only standout of the group because she's wearing a short party dress that it's camouflaged whereas her peers are all in normal military garb and in fact from this point going forward posh spice kind of stands out as the kind of uptight one but they constantly shit on her 
And it's somewhat entertaining. It distinguishes her from her peers within the Spice Girls. We have very different reactions to Posh Spice. Go on. I think in this scene, the kind of gag of like, oh, she just walks beside the obstacle course while all the other girls are doing their thing. Yeah, but here in a moment, she's the one who gets thrown in the water in the Thames. You know, she's the one that drives the bus. She at least does something. She does, but she's also terrible throughout the movie. But she does something. Right. She does things, but it's such a low bar to say like, well, she's the best character because she does stuff. But maybe you're right. That's the sad thing. <laughs> That's the, 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 the sad truth I'm realizing in real time as we record this <laughs> is that you're probably right that she's the best character because she actually kind of has a character where none of the others really do do it's the old red letter media thing right of describe these characters without using their name or what they wear yeah and you can do that with posh spice and you can't really do that with baby I, i'm calling by their first names like i've got the poster on my wall hey let's cut to a haunted mansion at night Bo. oh my god because they're staying at the dance academy. Oh, is that where it is? Yes. So he oh. makes them all go to bed early. Oh. And then we go to Baby Spice's room where Riff Raff comes out of the toilet in the middle of the night. Our paparazzi creepo. And all the girls kind of wake up in the bedrooms as he's creeping through the house. And they start sneaking around the house, too, all Scooby-Doo style. Yep. And they end up in this bedroom together after they all scare each other in the hallways and shit. In, like, a big bed so that they're all keeping each other company and keeping each other safe. Scary Spice is like, Oi, I think maybe this is all because I got some kind of subconscious fear about doing this show and screwing it up. Because sometimes I have a dream that I'm singing in this concert, only me head is gone. Oi, I've had that same dream I have. Oi, oh, you did, Posh Spice? Oi, I had that dream too. Oi, we all had that dream. Oi, I had that dream too. You too? Yeah, we've all had that dream. Oi, 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 oi. And it's Posh Spice who's like, Oi, I had that dream too. Only I had me head. Only there was no makeup on it. Oi. Oi, indeed. And that's kind of it. Yeah. Then, because Riff Raff has recorded all of this because he was hiding under their bed, the next day, the headlines in the paper are all about Scary Spice being afraid of this concert they're, they're about to do. They're all scared to perform live. Cut to Clifford, who is psychotically throwing knives at a newspaper. I hate you! I hate you! So, Mr. Editor, it seems that you have reached the top of my shit list. Number one. With a bullet, you might say. He runs out into this large garden filled with walkways and topiaries where he finds the Spice Girls in this colorful tent made of rainbow-inspired sheer material. And Clifford comes in and he's just in a fit of rage. Look at that! Look at that! I want to strangle them all! I want to strangle all the Spice Girls! And they all just start mocking him. Oi, listen, you little piece of shit! You think you can strangle all five of us at the same time? Bring it! How about you just try it? I'll give you the first punch, I will. You throw one punch at me, and we're gonna come at you like a bunch of howler monkeys, we will. And speaking of, like, they drive him off. They just scream at him until he leaves. Uh-huh. Then, after they leave, they're like, Oi, you think he's got a chance with that little piece of ass that he has it for an assistant? Oi, I think he should hook up with Deborah. Maybe he could get her pregnant. Ginger Spice here chimes in with, Oi, did I ever tell you guys about this monkey what pees on anything it wants to fuck? And then after it pees on them, then they fuck with the pee on them. Oi, you show us that all the time. I know, it's just the sexiest animal in the animal kingdom it is. It reminds me of how I mate. It's kind of a metaphor for our life, how all the men in our lives piss all over us before they have sex with us. Yeah, and also how I literally piss on my sexual partners for my own gratification. I like to put lipstick on my sexual partners, and then I kick them in the dick with my steel toe boots, and then I make them wear my panties, and then I leave them in the room without having sex with them. Oi, that's why I like being part of this band. We're all sexually liberated with a healthy degree of acceptance of each other's kinks. I think that girl power is really about emasculating men, making them tuck their dicks up inside their ass crooks, and dancing around singing I'm a little teapot, wearing girls' panties, and wearing lipstick. 
Oh, that's the beauty of this. You think it's all about emasculating men and dressing up in like little girls. But for me, Sporty Spice, it's about stepping on the balls and the penis. <laughs> sometimes with heavy shoes and sometimes with spike shoes. And sometimes with no shoes at all. That's the girl power that I signed up for. <laughs> We cut back again to Mark McKinney. Hey there, Clifford. I got another idea. How about extraterrestrial terrorists take over a plane? And what do you think of that there, Normie? But this scene is really out of place because this second round of pitches, right. Clifford is now once again dressed as the Riddler from Batman. Because it's the same scene. It's just they cut it in half and puts <laughs> this part later. It's three days later. Yeah. All right. So it's just them pitching another thing. This is where they pitch the idea of, hey, Normie, it's going to be called Space Force 5. And Baby Spice is like a karate lady and Sporty Spice is a counter espionage agent and scary spice is a demolitions expert mm -hmm. and ginger spice is a master of disguise who turns into bob hoskins who talk about slumming in a movie jesus what does he do does somebody have pictures of him doing something riff raff does i guess mm, well bob hoskins right. apparently <laughs> foggy isn't the only one who enjoys toe sucking i guess and then posh spice just makes act sounds <laughs> like He's freely. He's freely. <laughs> and then in that scene, nothing else happens there. It's just they pitch this other movie that's another gag. That's, again, not funny at all, which is the, the problem with all this. is, Like you said, it, there's a room for this to be kind of surreal and wacky and silly in a way that feels, you know, no, like A Hard Day's Night or even Help or whatever. Or an episode of The Monkees. That's absolutely the tone that they're going for, and they just miss it by a country mile, <laughs> where it's like they're lining up for the winning shot at the in the big game, and the ball goes over the goal and like down the hallway. It's, it's just a bad, bad scene. Alan Cumming. Who I forget is in this movie. As soon as they cut back to him, I was like, oh, right, he's in this movie. Yeah, you forget that Alan Cumming is in this film and he's making this documentary. And at this point, he's interviewing these two girls who have won a contest to meet the Spice Girls. And so these two girls get on the Spice bus where there's food and there's presents. And these two young girls are forced to have their pictures taken and they're being told where to go and what to do as the winners of this contest. Perhaps they are being groomed to be Spice Girls 2.0. During this meeting, Posh Spice says, Oi, it's great being a Spice Girl, except you gotta work under a fascist slave driver named clifford we should escape his place which is what they do they open up a window on the bus and as it stops they jump off the bus grab these two children hop onto a boat where they are followed by alan cumming and his film crew who get onto a separate boat and then we get yet another song montage set to my boy lollipop as the spice girls ride around on a boat and this whole scene ends with posh spice and the two children contest winners falling into the thames river and then sporty spice dives in the water to save them and then alan cumming falls into the water for no good damn reason and then this whole sequence ends with everybody just getting pulled out of the water except Riff Raff has a scuba suit on like he's james bond yeah and has gotten pictures of all this and clifford actually says to deborah at one point oh lord if any of this ever got out to the public they would crucify the spice girls for destroying the children that we were loaned by their parents it does get out and then it's like what the spice girls had this river adventure and then clifford is just beside himself with anxiety he goes down to talk to the spice girls and the spice girls are like oi we was you having fun we was and then things get real confrontational with the spice girls and clifford and then the spice girls they want to be respected and have freedom he says you have a schedule to meet right do what i say i am a man drive a ford taurus you will do what i say oi we're gonna do what we want eh and we're gonna do it to you if you we decide a, to you put away that lipstick and you put your steel-toed boots back on the shelf i will not be manhandled by a group of women oi well if that's how it's gonna be i'm gonna fuck off then wait no no don't go oi well if she's fucking off then i'm fucking off wait you're the second of the five you can't leave you three you'll certainly stay right oi if they're fucking off i'm definitely fucking off look there's two of you left give me the lipstick i'll put it on myself it's too late for that i'm fucking off too quick 
Grab your steel-toed boots. I'll pull down my pants. I'm already wearing women's undergarments. It's a fetish that I have. Please don't leave me. James Bond will yell at me later while holding a teacup pig. Fuck off. <laughs> so they all take off and Clifford is like, well, then I've done it. I've finally destroyed the Spice Girls. Dun, dun, dun. So he calls the chief who's petting a pig, and <laughs> which is, again, a true statement. Clifford says, look, the show will go on, even if I have to expose the world to the panties that I wear, quite frankly, because they feel good and they make me look good. Roger Moore is like, listen, darling, the headless chicken can only know where he's been. He can't see where he's going. Don't be that chicken. This doesn't make any sense at all. And so Riff Raff is taking pictures of Clifford, which I don't think ever comes up again. Uh, no. Back at the daily event or whatever, uh huh. this reporter Brad is telling Kevin, the editor, oh, look, the girls had a fight and Clifford is saying that they may not turn up for the show. Right. And the editor is like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what's happening to my face? I, I, I've never felt this way before. <laughs> Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Reminding the viewer theoretically that this is the big villain of the movie, the puppet master behind the destruction of the Spice Girls. Yeah, it don't matter. The fact that they pay this off so shittily, I mean, we're, we're coming up on it, but it's like, wow, just nobody cared about actually making a movie here. Mm -mm. So after this big fight, all the girls have gone their separate ways. Ginger Spice is watching this old romance on TV, and we get a title card that says, a long time ago. What, last year? You're right. And also, it's at a restaurant and not an audition space, but, uh -huh. you know, whatever. It turns out all the Spice Girls are simultaneously recalling their origin story, where they were hard scrabble girls trying to make it in this crazy world, and they're trying to scam this dude who's trying to make a buck running an eatery of some kind. It's like a coffee shop or something, but they're also there with their friend Nicola, who is unpregnant at the time. Well, sure. And then in this flashback, simultaneous, all at once, remember when moment, we get to see the Spice Girls with their friend sing their most famous song, Wannabe, which is a catchy pop song. I'm not pro pop music or anti-pop music i'll hear pop songs but i go that's a catchy song i'm not gonna put it on my playlist but i can certainly acknowledge the attractiveness of it and that's a it's a catchy tune yeah there are a handful of those kind of big pop songs wannabe isn't one of my favorites but something like i want it that way is one of those for me where yeah. i'm like and that's just a good song they're catchy pop songs. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 they follow a formula. I was curious during this flashback sequence why Nicola, the pregnant friend in the future, why she isn't their manager in the movie. She was probably in the band and they just peep bested her right out of there, you know? She has no connection to anyone. If she had been the manager and she had been pregnant and her fella had left her, and then you got Roger Moore as the asshole driving them to do this, like it, that would have worked better, but nobody thought about that. Nobody asked me. <laughs> So <laughs> this is one where even patented pick six movies fan fiction we could do it on every scene there are 15 different ways this could have been a better movie absolutely N number one is puppets <laughs> puppets Sorry. number but number one is anyone on this set giving a shit about the movie yes because that does not exist in the no. in this film so so they they sing wannabe and everything and then it turns out all the girls kind of converge on this old restaurant oi where's the guy what used to own this place we took him for all kinds of money i want to see him again so i can rub his filthy face in the fact that we got one over him we're big and rich and famous and we never pay for any of our food or nothing hey what say we go someplace and get some chips or some bangers or some crisps or some biscuits or some other British food. We could go talk about what it's like to be rich and famous, you know, like we wasn't a year ago. And so they're just back together. Like this fight lasted for two and a half minutes of the movie. Uh, they're now totally friends again. They wander over to some park bench. Oi, do you think we changed when we became super millionaires and started to abuse men in all the ways that we fantasized about? And they're like, well, we just worry about different things now. Like, hey, is my boot big enough to crush a testicle? <laughs> <laughs> and then in a moment of genuine prophecy, Baby Spice is like, 
Oi, maybe one of these days, this is all going to come to a crashing end in like six months. Then there's another family guy cutaway. Uh Oh boy, you're going to love this. What you got for me, dear? Okay, so you know that fella Stephen Fry? Yeah. He's a sort of the gay British fella. Ah, yeah, that's most of them. But yeah, I know you're talking about there. He's been fat and then he was thin and now I think he's fat again. Probably. But he's so funny. He's so dry witted. He reminds me of Larry down at the co op. He just has a way about him, just the way he says things. I could listen to Larry down there. Just read me the latest feed prices, and oh boy, I'll just be in stitches. So, Stephen Fry, he's going to be a judge. In the movie, he's going to be a judge. Yes, he's not actually a judge, and I don't think we have it in the budget to send him to law school. Nah, not at all. But he could be up there judging the quick and the dead if you needed him to. Yeah, yeah. And so he's going to find the girls guilty of releasing a song that is uh, uh, not the new hotness. Oh! And they're going to be sentenced to a, a song entering the charts at number 137 before it drops off immediately. And then this is the real capper. What's that, dear? They got to go on a bunch of Taiwan chat shows and have to talk about how they used to be famous. Let me throw a little bit of spitballing out there. What if the judge were to come down and take a homemade bone shiv and cut out the girl's tongues and then feed them to some demon dogs that had showed up from the gates of hell? Oh, you know, this is why we're writing partners. Those were the first pages I sent over. And wouldn't you know, this Kim Fuller fella and the rest of the Spice Girls, they sent it back. They sent it right back. And they said, we can't have tongues being cut out in this movie. I said to them, I said, well, then what are we even making? What are they doing here? Are we making a movie that at its heart is a a, a love letter to the demon god Thoth? Or are we not? Because if we're not, then this is not going to make any sense. If you cut out all the Thoth, this is all going to be nonsense. Nah, I don't think they understand the numerical connection of each of the letters in the title of their movie, Spice World. You connect that to the letters of Thoth's unholy sequence of numerical events, and clearly it points out that it's going to be the end of days. We get this movie into theaters, it's going to get everybody on our side, and we're going to be able to rise up, take over. Oh yeah, it's going to be a, a a true hell on earth finally finally it's gonna be the day that we've just all been praying and and killing for all these years i gotta tell you you know it's crazy once this movie gets into the theaters there's gonna be all kinds of lightning coming down and striking the unbelievers it's gonna be just a delight Oh, it's going to be so much fun. Look, the reason I got rid of Ralph in the first place was because I plan to be a demon bride. You know, I've been saying that oh, for some yeah. time, that once oh. once we get him to walk the earth, I, I plan to be uh, the bride of one of the Unholy Legion. Absolutely. Why do you think I got so many vagina piercings? The next time you go for one, remind me because, you know, I've been looking for that baker's dozen. Anyway, on the back end of this scene, the Stephen Fry gag. Okay, there are two jokes in the movie that make me laugh. One is Stephen Fry's pronunciation of Howty and the Bluefish. I think that's very funny. You and I are very different people, but (laughs) go on. I'm laughing at Ginger Spice kicking a guy in the asshole, and you're laughing at Howty and the Blowfish. I like someone calling Hooty and the Blowfish, which is arguably one of the worst travesties visited on music. You and me come from different worlds. Find that shit funny. Watching the Spice Girls. Ain't nothing I can do. I don't want to be like you. I'm a regular Weird Al Yankovic over here. Break out the accordion there. You're going to get a Grammy. They uh, decide, the Spice Girls do, that they are going to buck this idea uh, that they are becoming too beholden to fame and all that by going to just snatch this pregnant friend of theirs out in the middle of the night to take her to a club. She's now nine months and one minute pregnant. Then we cut to Clifford, who is drunk at a bar. Mm -hmm. And then Deborah, the assistant band manager, shows up. And this is where we get Elvis Costello as the bartender. Who just says, what'll you have? And they're like, "Uh, I'll have like a gin tonic. And he's like, all right then. And that's, that's the cameo. 
<laughs> Paging Mr. Herman. Mr. Yeah. Pee Wee Herman. Deborah. <laughs> What drink can I get for you, oh, Deborah? My poor is true. So you got a Clifford now. Clifford, who's an angry creep, he sort of puts the moves on Deborah, but then that scene ends. So we then cut to this crazy nightclub that's full of drag queens and club kids, and it's all unka, 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 unka. Right. The entrance is the the same entrance to Space Mountain, which I like. <laughs> we hear the Spice Girls song, Who Do You Think You Are, playing, because it's the right. Spice Girls movie. And it's a real club hit. Wouldn't you know it, Bo? At the stroke of midnight, our pregnant friend Nicola goes in to labor must have been all of her jumping up and down and the strobe lights and months of ingestation that really did it and also at a certain point the spice girls just abandon her like they take her out to this club oi we want to dance oi you can't dance with us you got a great big belly and you're no fat oi we'll see you later then you stay up here on the balcony like a big piece of shit and they go down uh, to the floor and they're dancing around and that's when she's like oh my baby oi she's having a baby we gotta get her to hospital we do they rush her to the spice bus and they tell Meatloaf, Oi, we gotta get our friend to the hospital. Meatloaf starts to take off. The girls are have her in the back in the spice bus. And they're just yelling at her vagina where they're like, Oi, baby, stay inside that belly. Baby, if you come out, I'm gonna punch you in the fine face. Scary Spice says, Oi, don't make her laugh. If you make her laugh, it's gonna shoot out of her like a cannonball, it will. Oi, don't worry. We got these bus walls cannonball proof on account of that time we played pirate. Meatloaf finally, they get him to the hospital. And then they go to the settiest set that ever set it, Chad. Uh huh. Where it is this hospital room with a hospital bed, an IV bag, yep. and that's it. And a yeah. curtain. There ain't nothing else. They don't even have the machine that goes bing. It is embarrassing production design. It's not even production design. It's just a bed in a room. The sound quality is terrible. This movie is stunningly cheap. It really is surprising yeah. how cheap and badly done it is. This hospital room's a real call the midwife best case scenario. And so <laughs> while they're at the hospital waiting on this baby to be born, some parents just wander up to the Spice Girls and are like, hey, our son's in a coma, but he's a big fan. Uh -huh. I was wondering if you just come, you know, lay on hands or whatever. Oi, we can do that. Where is he? Grab my lipstick. Oi, let's go get a girls oh, 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 <laughs> they go into this kid's hospital room where he got clocked on the head and he's unconscious. Oi, hey, Ginger Spice, why don't you show him your tits? I'll wake him up. I would, but his eyes are closed. It wouldn't do no good. And then the kid's eyes pop open. Bang. Right. In that but scene, nothing else happens. We l check in with Clifford over at the big music hall, uh -huh. and where he is just stalking the stage and checking his watch and everything. And Deborah comes up, and Clifford says, "Do you have any idea where the spy schools are?" I, you know what? No, not not even a little bit of an idea. Damn it, Deborah! We have to find them, and that's it. And then we cut back to the hospital where Nicola, who's still in labor, and all the Spice Girls are around. And again, there's no doctors or machinery. And there's a couple of nurses. And one nurse says to the other, what you going to be doing tonight? And the other one says, well, I was hoping to go see the Spice Girls in concert. Hopefully, if they don't bullshit with their friend here. And then the Spice Girls give it out like, oi, that's right. We've got a contractual obligation to perform tonight at Albert Hall. And then Nicola says, you don't need to stay. Just go. And the Spice Girls are like, oi. Yes, we do. You're more important to us than performing at any concert and making money. And finally, Jerry gets a, or Ginger Spice gets a call from Clifford. Oi, who's this? Listen, Ginger Spice, I need all of you girls to get down here. People are starting to come in. You've got contracts, responsibilities, and I will murder all of you. Oi. She tells him to piss off. Oi, you wouldn't understand about friendship and loyalty and babies. We do get a shot of Alan Cumming filming Clifford while he smokes cigarettes nervously, and he gets all panicked, and he turns around and starts spitting on Alan Cumming. It's pretty yeah. awesome. I mean, gross. It's weird. We cut back to the hospital, and Nicola has her baby easy as you please. It just kind of pops out. Before they run off, though, Chad, the worst line of the movie. Let's hear it. It's when the baby is born and Ginger Spy says, Oi, now that is girl power. Ugh. 
I'm all for a good message and all, but fuck you. <laughs> they see the paparazzi photographer Riff Raft, and they see he's up to no good, and the Spice Girls are like, Oi! Let's get that guy! <laughs> so they all chase after him, and then he jumps up in the air, lands on a gurney, and smashes into the wall, where the movie introduces Mark McKinney's voiceover, narrating what we, the audience, are seeing in the, and I use this term loosely, movie, as the potential plot of what's happening, excuse me, I can't even say that, as the the narrative shit goings ons of our audio visual thing. Don't let the plot get away from me. Get out of here, Elton. This whole ending feels like it should be more clever than it is, but it's not. It's just another shot of confusion into the arm of this already perplexing movie. Whatever Mark McKinney says in voiceover is what is happening in the real life of the Spice Girls. So let's just wrap this up. The Spice Girls, yes. they run down, they get back on the Spice bus. Meatloaf is sitting over in the grass in front of the hospital. So Posh Spice jumps into the driver's seat and she takes off driving to Albert Hall. The the only reason we have any urgency of getting to the show is because of what Mark McKinney is narrating. At one point, the Spice Girls end up on top of the Spice Bus in this fake car chase. There's some nuns that show up in a car to cause a delay. There's a bridge that raises up and the Spice Bus jumps over it. But because the movie has no budget, they use like a tiny toy car model to jump mm -hmm. a fake tiny toy bridge. The whole sequence is very simple silly and quite honestly there should have been more of this in this movie if the whole thing had been tied together with this so like you made all the weird family guy-esque asides part of mark mckinney developing this story if the movie had been that. them trying to figure out what the spice world movie was perfect it would have all made sense you could do all the gags you wanted yep. to do you could do all the musical performances and all that stuff and you kind of make the spice girls while they're, they're the stars of the movie they're not the narrative thrust of the movie it could have been completely fabricated with them in it and it, I think it would have been much better. But anyway, yes. so the Spice Girls show up on this bus. Before they arrive, they discover that there's a bomb on the bus and they all scream. Then the Spice Girls get off the Spice bus and run into Albert Hall as we hear the theme from the movie Rocky play. On their way in, they run into some cops that are like, Halt! You're going to jail. You're the Spice Girls. And so Baby Spice uses her sexy childlike nature to make this cop go gaga and let them pass. Or as we call it, the cannonball run. <laughs> the reverse Gandalf. Uh, yeah, I like the fact that this at least is something that pays off from earlier in the movie. You kind of establish that she has this weird superpower and you use it later in the film. Like if there had been three more instances of that, then maybe you got something. Something. but it doesn't support the whole girl power thing it's like tits and ass power yes i'm manipulating you because i'm so sweet and innocent yet you know i'm a grown sexy woman and it's <sighs> eh. the spice girls show up to prevent clifford from hanging himself on stage that's a thing that's going to happen in this movie he has a noose in his hand and is ready to commit suicide in front of a paying audience and this is the other actual laugh of the movie for me not clifford saying well i'm gonna go on stage stage the band will strike up the curtain will open and i will hang myself on stage the spice girls run in and he's like ah yes you're here i love you i love you spice girls and kind of throws the noose aside it's when they cut to alan cummings it, and it's a very quiet moment and that's why it works where he kind of does this like rub of his chin three times and then he says well that's run a perfectly good end of the movie <laughs> It's a great delivery. It's incredibly deadpan. It's very funny. And it's just because Alan Cummings is a very good comedic actor and he pulls that line off well. But then we cut to Roger Moore feeding a <laughs> teacup pig a bottle of milk. That's uh -huh. weird. Yeah, there's that bit. And then Clifford runs into Deborah backstage before the show starts. You know, Deborah, there's that thing that people do when they feel bad about something. And she says, you mean apologize? And he says, yes, that. I would like to do that. And you're like, for what? What? I don't earn What is your relationship again? I mean, what? yes, she's your assistant, but it's never been close. Did you watch this with subtitles on? Because as she walks away. Because yeah, I, I did hear this where he says, I love you. Yeah. 
what in his behavior up to that second has ever suggested that he I don't know. treated her as anything but he's a- gonna stab her with sewing shears while she sleeps i'm certain of that this whole thing is an insurance scam from jump he is gonna seduce her poison her and collect the money clifford then tells george went Norm. that he and mark mckinney can make a spice girls movie and then the spice girls sing another song called spice up your life it's got a nice little samba beat during their performance at albert hall it's a catchy pop song and chad if i could i would like now to turn to the book of spice yes and read some lyrics from the song Spice Up Your Life. <clears throat> Yellow Man in Timbuktu. Color for both me and you. Kung Fu Fighting. Dancing Queen. Tribal Spaceman. And all that's in between. You may sit. That is garbage. Yeah, it's pretty shitty. They perform the song. We see most of the people who aren't actually famous and would never sit around to wait for the concert footage. Like, you're never going to see Elton John in in the concert crowd. Nah, he's too busy in the dumpster. You know. <laughs> Look at her. Can you find a sandwich tonight? Hammer tuna will do. Whole wheat or rye, or maybe sourdough bread. I'm hungry. How about you? Shoo, Elton. Ooh, speaking of Weird Al, look who's got the food based song parodies. <laughs> Let's put this one to bed. Um, yeah. Finally, after they finish their song, the movie fades out and then it fades back in and we get this footage that feels like it wants to be behind the scenes, like a peek behind the curtain of this shithole of a movie. But it's the movie that they're going to make about the movie you just saw. But it's after they did all that because of the things anyway. It's an added layer of garbage. Yes. Mark McKinney is talking to the bald, creepy photographer, paparazzi guy about about their role in the movie and then this all devolves into the spice girls chit-chatting with alan cumming and the actress who plays deborah about their roles and then they eventually just walk over and look into the camera and start talking to the audience and they're specifically calling out individuals in the audience of the movie theater but then at one point baby spice just pivots oi some of these people are watching this movie at home video that guy over there he's got his pants off he's stroking his cocky edge oi how about you get your hands north of the border, or else we come out of this TV like Samuel from the ring? Oi, that's all we're going to do. We know where you live. We can see your house. We're going to go and tell your girlfriend or your wife what you've been up to, you pervert. Grab that stupid lipstick, put it on your mouth, put on your girl's panties, and dance around singing Mary Had a Little Lamb. You know what we demand. That's right. Me and the rest of the Spice Girls got the power of Japanese girl ghosts. We'll come through the TV and step on your balls in person. Can you feel the Oi. panties tonight? Go, get out of here, Elton John. Thunk. What, and then one of the Spice Girls goes, Oi, what about that bomb we mentioned earlier on the bus? What if we do somewhere at right now? And they all look over and then there's a huge explosion and all the Spice Girls say, Oi, 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 And that's it. The movie fittingly ends with a bomb. Yeah. Roll credits. And there's a jazzy little number that the Spice Girls sing called The Lady is a Vamp. Mm-hmm. And that's the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. Chad, what did you think of Spice World? Honestly, it's awful. It's truly one of the worst things I've ever seen. I thought it would be a real challenge to find a movie as a contender to be the bottom of my six this season when we finished Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. But I got to tell you. Can I pick them or can I pick them? This one's got a chance of being my bottom. It was rough to get (laughs) through. It's terrible. Watching this the first time is kind of mind-blowing because of what it is yes. and that notes pass is the one that hurts where you're like oh god 
This is terrible. <laughs> Doing notes on this was no fun. It is such a shitty, shitty movie. For people who've never seen this and never will, if I had to describe what it's like, it's like stopping off at an interstate truck stop, going into the bathroom that just smells horrible, and then you leave and then you realize for some weird reason you've got to go back into it. Or you come out of that bathroom and you're like, wait a second, why do I smell like that bathroom? What did I touch? <laughs> Is what what part of me is it on? It's head scratchingly bad. It's really, really awful. Terrible, terrible movie. <sighs> but we're not done yet, Chad. What's episode four? Because it's not my turn yet, is it? <laughs> no. Is this another pick of yours? <laughs> it is. Shit. And this is a better movie. It's it's a better movie in that it's a movie. But we are going to be slowing down and chilling out, Chad. Uh oh. It is time for one uh, Vanilla Ice and the film Cool as Ice. Yeah, I knew this was coming. Oddly enough, aside from Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, every movie we're reviewing this season, I've never seen. And I have not seen Cool as Ice. So this will be a fun adventure for me, maybe. Uh, here's the thing about Cool as Ice. It's not a good movie, but it's a movie with a structure, mm -hmm. which is going to be a nice change of pace around here. And movie stuff happens in it. It's real dumb. And I think we're going to have a real good time with it, but it's not the mess of nonsense that a Spice World is. Gotcha. And for those of you who bet the over when you should have took the under on this episode, <laughs> suckers. I told you not to get took on this, people. I told you up front, you know? I said, look, you invited me to play. I said I'm going to take all your money. <laughs> Idiots. As always, like, rate, review. Come back and see us in two weeks. We will be here with Vanilla Ice and I'm sure a motorcycle. There's probably mm -hmm. going to be rapping of some sort. Oh, there, there will be rapping. Oh my God. What are we doing with our lives, Bo? I'm going to stop, Chad. I'm going to collaborate. I'm uh -huh. going to listen. Because from what I understand, Ice is back uh -huh. on a lyrical mission. And I, I'm curious to see the results of said mission. <sighs> Come back and see us in two weeks' time. We will be here with more voices and silliness and opinions and facts and movie history and fun. And, Bo, any final thoughts on Spice World? <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening, everybody.